Hey everybody, it's Gil with the Sailing Vessel Dream Chaser, and in last week's episode we showed the progress that had continued on the stainless steel lifelines. We also went ahead and did some maintenance work on both of the engines. They've been sitting for a long time and we needed to make sure that the impellers and everything were ready to go when the fuel lines were finished and we went ahead and started it up. If you're new to our channel, my wife and I do videos every single week about our lifestyle living aboard and refitting our classic sailboat. This week, we're going to start looking at that fuel system and showing how we designed that fuel system and what the BR did to get it all set up for us. We'll also do a little bit of work on the um, Mizzen Traveler. Thanks, stay tuned, we'll see you guys in a bit. We're likely going to get the engine started. I'll show in a couple of minutes the new fuel system that's been installed. Uh, it's almost complete and I asked them to leave the last step and wait for me so I can spend some time with the mechanic and really go through how to charge the system, how to bleed it. Um, I, I've kind of looked at it. I can see the routing of all the um, draw and return lines, but really want to, I want to do firsthand experience on how to maintain and bleed this system. Um, just that if I ever have a problem down the road, I'm a little bit more self-sufficient. Um, you know, bringing the boat to the yard, I, I had an issue with my fuel, and I was not able to get everything switched over and bled correctly. Uh, it was very disappointing, and I don't like that personal disappointment. Uh, the, the fuel system was just a mess before, and now it's uh, it's nice and clean and simplistic and valves appropriate and all new, all new lines. So I think we're in much better shape. Let me take you down and show you that fuel system because they've done a, a pretty amazing job with that. All right, forgive the mess here, but I'm going to see how well I can show this. So let me first start by kind of explaining the tank situation. So down below in the floor there, we have a day tank, and there's a, a draw and a return valve on that. Over here on the port side, we have one of our primary fuel tanks, and there's a draw and return right there. We're going to have to put an access plate right in that spot. On the starboard side, we have our uh, third diesel tank, and the port and starboard ones are the primary large ones. Each of those are somewhere between 65 and 80 gallons, and then the one, the day tank down in the salon floor is, uh, I think, 28 or 30 gallons. So let me kind of step on the engine here. Let me show you a little bit about what we have. I'm going to back up so we can get a holistic view here. So the thought in the fuel system was to really simplify it essentially have a draw line and a return line to each fuel tank and at the fuel tank itself have a cutoff so I can turn on the draw and the return it means it's going to draw from that tank and all the return fuel that doesn't get burned will go back to that same tank to keep that simple we're doing the same thing on all three tanks so all of them have a draw and a return valve only so if you think about what's happening there there's going to be drawing from a specific fuel tank so that's three sort of inputs that can go to the engine so those three inputs all go into a uh, I'll call it a manifold, if you will. Uh, and that's a, a place where all the fuel coming in goes to a single point. From that single point, it then goes through a fuel pump, which is going to help us with bleeding. And it goes into our primary, or our, sorry, our, our, our auxiliary filter. So a, a large filter boss style um, dual Raycore filter. It's going to go through that. Um, from there, it splits and it goes either to the generator or to the engine, whichever one happens to need the fuel or both if you need be. So then for, let's just use this as a primary example of using the, um, the main engine in the boat. When that engine is running, any fuel that's not burned then goes to a return line. That return line, very similar to the intakes, goes to a return manifold. And from that return manifold, it's going to go to one of three possible tanks. The only one it'll actually go into is the one with the valve open. If I were to, um, for example, open all three of those return valves, essentially a third of my fuel would go to each of those tanks, theoretically, right? It may be a little different based on the, the flow of the fuel. So let me kind of show you the layout of this thing. We'll start with this tank because I think it's the easiest one to see. The two yellow handles are the, um, are the uh, draw and return lines. In all cases, draw is on the right-hand side when you're looking at the two, uh, the two valves. So that means that this here is my draw and this one up here is my return. So if these were to open up, the fuel would flow through those lines. Let me, so I've just come to the side. When that valve on the right-hand side is opened up, the fuel would go through that blue fuel line and it comes right here into this manifold you see. Uh, you can see there's three lines on that. That's because there's an input from each of the three different tanks. You can see that small canister right here. That is actually a small fuel pump. From that fuel pump, the line goes right into the bottom center of this and it can be redirected with this valve to either the port or starboard Raycor filter. And you notice it's got a vacuum gauge on it to show you if you're starting to have a clogged filter and need to adjust it. 
On the very bottom of this, you see a blue fuel line going in each direction. The one that goes to the left goes up to the generator. The one that goes to the right comes back here to the primary engine where it connects up to the primary fuel filter, lift pump, and ultimately to the injectors. So let's talk about the return lines right now. So this is where we started with that starboard tank. And you can notice this, uh, this set of hoses right here. It's a T and it's not actually connected to anything. That's where the return line from the primary engine is going to go. The one on the bottom side of this T is coming from the generator. And ultimately that T flows into this particular manifold. And just like before, we have a manifold where all of the return lines come into that. And then we have three lines going out, one going back to any of the three tanks that we ultimately have open at the valve level. So as you can see, it's going to be a rather simplistic model compared to what I had before, which was essentially these fuel lines that went into a three-way valve that wasn't labeled, and I didn't have any control over the return lines. I actually don't even know where they were going. Um, when I ran into a problem before with that other, other system, I, I wasn't even sure where to go and bleed and which was an input and which was a return. I tried to follow them, but honestly, it had been so um, hodgepodge together. What we had were uh, solid... Um, solid fuel lines, I assume they were copper, right? So, but solid fuel lines um, in a lot of places, but then where they needed to extend it or move the generator, they essentially cut those fuel lines and just had rubber fuel hose, uh, hose clamped onto the ends of the raw hard tubing. Uh, it was just it was just wrought with potential um, air leaks and failures. And uh, I'm not a diesel mechanic in any way, shape or form. As a matter of fact, mechanical issues are probably my, um, my least uh, valued skill. I, it's the area I have the most area for improvement in. But everybody I've spoken to says that most diesel problems come down to fuel issues. Fuel, fuel, fuel. So I want to make sure that we have a way to uh, eliminate some of the possible pains associated with that and really understand how this dual uh, Raycor filter boss works from a, um, a changing it underway, if you will, right? How, if I, how do I change that valve, um, change the filter itself, pump more fuel into it so I don't have to bleed it beyond that, and then ultimately switch back to that other other uh, filter while underway. Uh, that's the whole beauty of that type of a system. So I just have to learn how to use it. Well, good Saturday morning, everybody. I have a very short working weekend between two traveling weeks for work. So I was out Monday through, uh, or Wednesday through Friday last week. Um, I'm down here Saturday morning. I've got a flight out tomorrow evening, Sunday evening, and I'll be gone till Tuesday or Wednesday. So I'm not going to get a ton done. So I'm thinking I'll try and wrap up a couple of loose ends. I think I want to get the traveler car bedded, um, maybe get the um, Mizzen traveler um, beam put back together and mounted back on the boat. Um, I'm going to put the hatch on and I'm going to see if I can't at least start to build some templates for where I'm going to need to rebuild uh, a small... I don't know how else to drive this. There's stringers under the battery compartment are shot. They're rotted. So I need to essentially build a, a small bulkhead almost um, that's going to help support that battery compartment. Uh, so I'm going to take a look and see what my options are there as well. Come on aboard. Oh, I also went ahead and epoxied the small spacer for the um, Mizzen Traveler. Let me show you that. Real simple, nothing fancy. I had just put a light stain on this and just have one coat of epoxy on it really just to help waterproof it before I bolt it inside of the stainless steel. I think I'm going to start with just getting this hatch put in. It, it's not really installation at all. It's just setting it on there, but it'll be nice to get it done. Nice. Kind of show you what this looks like. Yeah. yeah. Sounds a little too bright that direction, but it actually looks good. So these holes right back here is where I'm gonna mount that traveler. Yeah, I'm off to I'm off to West Marine. Um, I have my, my small main sheet traveler car, and there's a pretty good uh, nick out of it. I, I'd hate to lose my main sheet with all that sail area one day because that metal 
wears through or something. So before I bed this thing down, I'm going to go see if I need to get a new uh, traveler bar and car or if I can just get a car to replace it. So let me go check it out here real quick before I bed this down, which was the next thing on my agenda here. In order to start assembling the Mizzen Traveler, I went ahead and took the metal track that the Traveler car itself rides on and started to scrape and clean it up a little bit. It had coats of varnish and everything else along the edges just from years and years of maintenance prior to this, where it was maybe a little sloppy, wasn't taped off, and I wanted to get it nice and cleaned up. You can see I'm just using a scraper for most of this to get the heavy stuff off. I'm now using sandpaper to just clean up some of the varnish that's on the traveler car itself. What it looks like is somebody probably took a, br a varnish brush and, and was working underneath this to varnish the actual wooden support uh, and, and just touch the bottom side of it. So there was coats of varnish on that as well. And I'm using the sandpaper to smooth up and remove that from the cast bronze pieces. I realized that just scraping with a paint scraper wasn't gonna be enough on the actual traveler beam itself. So I went ahead and just used a, uh, a fine grit sandpaper on a belt sander and just rubbed along the edges here to get some of the, uh, the old varnish and you know dirt and wear and tear off of it. And now it's really just a matter of reassembly of all these parts. I'm using a cordless drill with a drill bit in it to go ahead and screw the screws down through all these different parts. Um, so it starts by going down through the metal support that the traveler car itself runs on and then it goes uh, it goes through that small wooden spacer that you saw me make in, in a video prior and then I put a coat of varnish on it, I'm sorry, epoxy on it in the beginning of this video. Uh, that, it goes down through that, then through the teak support and all the way to the bottom of it. And for each one, they're countersunk on the actual uh, traveler beam itself and then on the bottom side there is a washer along with um you know a quarter by 20 nut um there's about i don't know 12 to 14 bolts that go through this and then of course the ends of this traveler uh beam have a small uh small end cap on them that prevents the traveler car from sliding off of either end the last step was to reinstall the two cleats that are on this bar. These are actually used when we're hoisting the dinghy on the davits. And then these are the cleat that the davits, um, uh, davit lines actually tie onto. At this point, it's just a matter of reassembling and putting it on the boat. Well, good Sunday morning. I'm actually heading out of town for business today, uh, early this afternoon. So uh, I wanted to get a couple of things done. I just kind of came by the storage shed. I got one more coat of varnish on the butterfly hatch. Um, I've been just bringing some parts back down to the storage shed and keeping them there so I can start to make some progress on it, um, you know, before I head down to the boat or then when I'm, when I'm done with the day. And the good news is Deb will be able to add a couple of coats while I'm out of town. So, uh, back down to the boat to get some more done down there. I think I'm going to try and put another coat of all wood MA clear gloss along all the tow rails. As long as it doesn't look like it's going to rain down there, it looks pretty good here. All right, I made it down to the boat. Uh, I, I'm going to go ahead and get that all wood down on these tow rails, as I mentioned. Uh, the first thing I did is I went ahead and just put some tape around each of the stanchions um, that way, and around the base as well. That way I can uh, make sure that as I'm varnishing, I don't get any of these nice new stainless rails that Nick's working on. Let me show you what I did just to quickly tape that up. It's not extensive. It's just enough. So here where these uh, stainless steel rails go down through the teak cap rails, uh, you can see here, I went ahead and uh, let me zoom in a little bit on this went ahead and just put up a, a bead of tape right around the top where it goes down through the uh, actual top of the cap rail and then just around the stainless bases. Uh, just want to avoid getting any kind of uh, varnish on those. These guys are working really hard at keeping them looking good. I don't want to be the guy that messes that up. Just to give you an idea on how good a job they did, there's a joint right here where these two are welded together. You cannot see it. I mean literally cannot see the joint at all. I gotta tell you, it's hot. I'm taking advantage of this little sail cover that Nick put up, the fabricator for the stainless, to just get out of the sun for a minute. I've got his fan, actually, that he left it on deck here running, too. Just get a little bit. It's uh, it's hot today. So I went ahead and uh, I hand sanded all of the tow rails and cap rails and spindles. Um, I used 220 and just gave it a light scan and uh, sand and scuff. Um, 
I also used a, a clear cotton cloth, um, just like an old t-shirt style material, to wipe them down. I actually had somebody ask in one of my previous videos why it was I didn't use tack cloths. Um, and interestingly enough, in the Allwood MA application guide, it specifically actually says not to use a tack cloth. I, I don't know exactly what the reasoning is. I'm assuming it's a residue. Maybe it's that little bit of oily buildup that's in the tack towel or tack rag that maybe um, prevents that chemical bond between layers of Allwood. I don't, I don't know what it is, but it's expensive enough and it's detailed enough. And when I called them about uh, letting the primer go more than 24 hours before I put the top coat on, they were pretty adamant that no, the instructions you really need to follow. So uh, I didn't want to chance it. So I went ahead and used the, the, cl the cloth uh, like it recommends. I did notice a couple of things I have to sort of work on here. When I was sanding the cap rails, there was a couple of spots where it was a little bit gummy. Um, it worried me at first. I thought it was a piece that didn't uh, that didn't um, set all the way. As it turns out, it's a piece of this sort of red um, tape that the, the stainless fabricator is using to hold things in place when he's actually doing the work. Uh, and there was a couple of spots where tape had either fallen off the stainless rails and landed on the on the cap rail. So uh, in those spots, I, I sanded them and they're real obvious where they are because the gumminess kind of picked up all the, the sawdust or the sanding dust. I am going to use a little bit of acetone on a rag and I'm going to wipe all that uh, clean and, and get rid of any of that sticky stuff that's on the surface. If you can't use a tack cloth, I suspect you probably shouldn't use some kind of big old industrial strength stainless steel tape either. So <laughs> I would get that done before I put a coat down on all this. I think I'm going to put a coat down and then I'm going to run to West Marine. I got to pick up a few bolts and um, here's how my mind works. I'd really like to go right now because it's hotter than blazes and there's air conditioning in my car and there's not right here. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to reward myself with the completion of this coat with the air conditioning. <laughs> so I always said before I need little victories in life. That just goes in. There's a little insight into the wackiness of my brain. <laughs>